You're listening to the Kingdom Project Podcast. These are discussions on biblical theology and interpretation. The emphasis is on context and grace. The goal is to promote biblical literacy by displacing and debunking most modern interpretations. The challenge is to engage in healthy conversation that may stretch, but sharpen iron. This is The Kingdom Project, and I'm your host, Marcus Hall. Hey, 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 welcome all to a new episode in the series on Revelation. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for downloading, streaming, uh, whatever it is that you do. Thank you so much. Uh, Subscribe, leave a review, leave a comment, disagree, agree. It doesn't matter. Let's just communicate, (laughs) right? Um, I've been receiving messages from overseas. That's fun. So, yeah, um, here we are now in this next episode. What is this, seventh? episode of the book of revelation as a primer just a basic overview now we're starting here in chapter eight and this is coming up to the this is the seven trumpets and the three woes um this is the seventh seal and the golden censer and then it leads into the seven trumpets and um we will be going through 8, 9, 10, and 11 um, as an overview, okay? Remember, overview. There's going to be a lot of stuff in here that I am not touching upon. Now, when we get to the next episode, um, it will be a little bit different probably because we will have to talk about certain things we're going to have to talk about these enemies these beasts uh go back to daniel 7 a little bit talk about uh you know things like that the mark and the mark of the beast and there there's the land beast okay things like that the land beast is the false prophet there's all this stuff okay so different views on that even with from a first century perspective so i will just i'm trying to get some of that together in the notes and just try to to hit upon it and i'll tell you what i think and then i'll uh, I possibly what i'm planning on doing is going well some say this and then others say this and there's a there's a wide range of 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 uh, of <laughs> <laughs> of interpretation on that even though it, it, it's from the first century point of view so anyway just been working on that okay so chapter 8 of revelation let's just look at this here really fast all right it's just one and two when the when the lamb opened the seventh seal there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour then uh now we've hit upon this okay and then uh Then it goes, Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Okay, so we'll move from the opening of the seven seals. Now we're going into the blowing of the seven trumpets. Now those take place in chapters 9, 10, and 11. Okay, Um, then we'll be dealing with the seven bulls of wrath. That comes in chapter 16. And, um, uh, so again, the, the three, seven, so <clears throat> there's an outline for the seven trumpets. Uh, I'm getting this from, uh, uh, Larry ball and he developed this following outline. Okay. So, uh, just, just as there was this interlude between the opening of the sixth and seventh seals, there will also be an interlude between the blowing of the sixth and seventh trumpet okay so the outline that larry has is uh the blowing of the first four trumpets this is revelation 8 chapter uh, verses 1 through 13 
The blowing of the fifth trumpet is Revelation 9, 1 through 12. And this is internal conflict in Jerusalem. The blowing of the sixth trumpet is Revelation 9, 13 through 21. The, om the armies approach Jerusalem. Then there's interlude. And then there's this witness, a drama witness, Revelation 10. And then the modern day drama witness. It's two more witnesses is Revelation 11, 1 through 14. And then you have finally the blowing of the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11, 15 through 19. In which then we go to another scene in heaven. So let us deal with the trumpets first. And we'll deal with them with comparing scripture with scripture. And by looking at trumpets in the Old Testament. Okay, so. The blowing of trumpets is not something new, all right? Um, the roots are in the Old Testament. The blowing of trumpets was heard on the Day of Atonement and at the beginning of the year of ju Jubilee, okay? Um, often it was used to call an assembly, like, hey, you hear the trumpet, we all better go, let's gather, all right? So, uh, the, the most familiar event in old, the Old Testament um, involving the blowing of seven trumpet, tr trumpets was the fall of the city of Jericho, right? In Joshua 6. The city of Jericho was the enemy of God's people and its walls came a tumbling down. All right, so that's you're probably familiar with that. If you need to revise that, go to Joshua chapter 6. Okay, so... Um, here, well, here's the thing. In the Old Testament, the destruction of Jericho was accompanied by the blowing of the seven trumpets. Now, here in Revelation, the tables have turned, okay? It's the destruction of the walls of Jerusalem that will be accompanied with the blowing of the seven trumpets. Now, Old Testament, Israel was the, the, the victor. Now, she's the victim, Okay, so uh, there's another reason uh, in here to believe that the blowing of these trumpets should be associated with a warning to the city of Jerusalem. All right. Um, I, I, again, I know there's a lot of repetition, but th this war was carried out over three and a half year period. Okay, and this from April uh, 67 to August 70. Okay, so, um, you know, we could say the, the long period of time was to give opportunity for the repentance of Israel to take place and to accept the gospel of Jesus, all right? And so there's this use of fractional numbers, and it, it's, it is prevalent in describing the period that's uh, uh, of, of the blowing of the seven trumpets, all right? A fractional number is indicating that these judgment will judgments will happen in increments. Okay, so um, and it and, and the fractional number is always one third. You know, um, you can look them up, but I, I, I will I won't go over them. But I was just like, I'll, I'll give you where they're mentioned. All right, chapter eight verses, uh, well, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven, and twelve. And then look at chapter 9 and verses 15 and 18, okay? This fractional number, one-third, is mentioned in, in each verse, all right? So now I think it's easy to overlook it, and that's, you know, probably a minor, it could be a minor detail to some people, all right? But I think it's an important uh, point just to look at because the fractional number, one-third, is, it, it's, it, I don't know, it's, it's just something to, to take notice of. Um, and I, I think because it's that the judgment of God comes in these increments in order to give time for repentance. I believe that's what's happening. Okay, so <clears throat> now, obviously, we're talking here about the destruction of Jerusalem. So it's obvious, Revelation, all right, 
what's going on that in, in Revelation 11, 8, that we're told that the city was mystically called, okay, it's referred to as Sodom and Egypt, all right? But it says it was the city where Christ was crucified, all right? It says, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is mystically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So we know Jesus was condemned and um, tried and found guilty and crucified on a cross just out the city, outside the city limits. But Jerusalem is where it happened. So John is telling us clearly that the events described in Revelation here are about the city of Jerusalem. All right, so the city had become like the pagan places of Sodom and Egypt. So the blowing of these seven trumpets would be a warning to that city. Okay, so we'll just move right into the first four trumpets, okay? Now, um, I'm not going to get heavy in details of the descriptions of the, 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 the destructive powers of God that are associated with the blowing of these trumpets, but um, they're generally uh, apocalyptic or metaphorical, and there's... Um, so what I'm saying, don't spend too much time reading too much into the language here because the language used to describe the results of the blowing of the first four trumpets is common in the Old Testament. All right, so th it's the theme surrounding the blowing of the seven uh, trumpets, um, which is to demonstrate the destructive forces of the Roman army as they approach Jerusalem, all right? Trumpet number one, there's hell and fire, and it's mixed with blood. That's in uh, Revelation 8. Okay, we're in, we're in 8 now. Revelation 8, 7, okay? Now, tr trumpet number two is in uh, verse, uh, verses 8 and 9, a great mountain burning with fire. It's going to be thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea will become like blood causing the sea creatures to die and a third of the ships will be destroyed. And then there's trumpet number three where in verses 10 and 11, where a, a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch. Um, and there's this name of the stars called wormwood and that's bitterness. And uh, that's the star that fell. Bitterness fell like a burning uh, <laughs> torch. Wow. And then a, a third of the waters became bitterness, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. That's the result of that. And in verse 12, we have trumpet number four, where a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck so that a third, okay, here we go, a third, a third of them would be darkened and the day would not shine for a third of it and the night in the same way. All right, so very grand imagery taking place here okay very descriptive very apocalyptic very metaphorical if you will uh, language and it, some of this is similar to the presence of god on mount sinai when the trumpet blew to warn the people that god was near um in the book of exodus in chapter 19 verse 16 it says so it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon uh, a click. I'm sorry. I got distracted by my phone because it's going off. Uh, <laughs> a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. All right, now also both the water turning in the blood and the curse of the darkness, um, that, that's reminiscent of the plagues that came upon Egypt. And a, a star falling from heaven in the Old Testament was always a language for a nation that was collapsing. Okay, so you should, you should get that, all of that. Um, you know, you can always go back and... Uh, refresh your mind with this type of language by going through these things in the Old Testament. So, 
This then brings us to the fifth trumpet or the first woe. Okay, so the the blowing of each of the last three trumpets were also called a, a woe, okay, in Revelation 8, 13. So with the blowing of the fifth trumpet, John John describes both a, the, a key and this bottomless pit, okay? So this we're going to see this language again later in the book in chapter 20, okay? So this uh, this bottomless pit, okay, abyss it, it was this the dwelling place of Satan and his demons. Okay? So when when now let's go back to the gospels and think when Jesus cast out the demons um back in Luke 8:31, all right? Um the demons response to Jesus was it, it, well, it says they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. All right. So Satan and his demons, demons hate, hated the abyss <laughs> because they can't do any damage there. All right. They wanted to be on earth, bringing sickness and death to all of God's creation. OK, but when Christ was physically on earth, the demons knew him. They recognized him. Uh, they were like, hey, why are you here before the appointed time? All right. So they were afraid of him and their their ability to do damage became limited. All right. And Jew, Jesus, blah, 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 blah. Jesus warned the Jews that if they did not repent, then the demons who were limited in the presence of Christ would come back to overpower them. Right. Um, you know, when he's talking about uncon an unclean spirit that goes out of a man. It passes through waterless places, you know. Um, he doesn't find it, so he says, hey, I'm going to return to my house, which where I came. So if he finds it unoccupied and um, uh, swept and put in order, all right, it's, it, it's going to go. It takes along with it seven other spirits. It's more wicked than itself, and they go in and they live there. And the last state of the man becomes worse than the first. All right. So and then Jesus says that is the way it will also be with this generation. This is in Matthew 12, uh, 43 through 45. So the Jews didn't repent. So whether it's demons or not, you know, I, I, I yeah, you know, um, I'm not trying. I'm not denying demonic activity. I'm not denying demons. Demons are obviously biblical. They're in there. So, you know, something's coming out of this abyss to do the work and the destruction of Jerusalem. That's the point. All right. So um, they also have a king over them. He's this angel of the abyss. And his, his name in Hebrew is Abaddon. Uh, and, and in the Greek, it's... Uh, I'm not sure. I have a note here. It says pronounce with a question mark. <laughs> and I obviously did not look that up. It's A-P-O-L-L-Y-O-N. And this is in Revelation 9-11. Okay, so these these words mean destruction, okay, um, in Hebrew and Greek. So these two words are, are a reference um, to the things coming out of the abyss. I just feel more comfortable saying that. I don't know why. Nevertheless, with the opening of the abyss, these demons come out to do their damage. The metaphor of locust, again from the plagues of Egypt, is used to describe them. Powers given to them like the scorpions of the earth, but again that power was limited. They could only harm those who did not have the mark of God on their foreheads. Now, um, well, you know, Revelation 9 4 says, hurt the, hurt the grass of the earth. Um, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but uh, they could not hurt. Do not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. All right? Whatever's going on here, whatever's coming out of this abyss, they're not allowed to kill, but only to, hor to torment. And the torment can only last for five months. It says locust. It's got, I mean, really, is it locust or is it, you know, demonic destructive power? Uh, 
I'm not going to go deep into that. This is just an overview. I'm just trying not to, you know. I I just want you guys to think, okay? Read it, read the text yourself and 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 think, okay? Now, um So it says then in 95 that they were not permitted to kill anyone, but their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. Now, Kenneth Gentry makes an inner resting um, observation here because he notes that the five-month period from April 70 to August 70 was the last five months of the final siege of Jerusalem. And the entire war lasted three and a half years. So in chapter 11, verse 12, as the temple was measured, there was a time frame given for the destruction of the holy city. And it says, And they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Well, 42 months equals uh, three and a half years. And in chapter 11, verse 3, this quantity of time was restated using the number 1260 days, which is the same as 42 months. So there you go. All right. Um, 42 months or three and a half years. You count each month is 30 days it's 30 times 42 that's 1260 all right so just putting that putting that in there for you <laughs> and now we're going to talk about the internal conflict in Jerusalem but actually on a side note before i go into that um and even though i said i'm not going to talk about it um the abyss, the bottomless pit, demons. Um, is God using demons? You know, that's the question. That's that's the conflict that we all have, I think. There's other interpretations for this. I'm just giving one of the most common ones when it comes to this. And um, I, I just, you know, is it a, I, I don't know. Um, Here's one thing that I can say. I, I don't know. Maybe may, maybe it's not metaphorical. Maybe we should take this one liter, literal and say there's some abyss that holds these crazy locusts in it. <laughs> I don't know, man. Um, but it, it's just kind of hard to say that an angel is opening an abyss to a let demons out to torture and torment men. Um, it's kind of odd, um, especially in light of the gospels and things like that. So, you know, I'm not sure. I'm just giving the basics here and that's one of the basics. So, uh, anybody else has anything else to add on that? That's better. Uh, leave a comment or send an email. Okay. So now, now we go to the internal conflict within Jerusalem itself. Okay. So these five months inside before that final siege was, great conflict okay so we have this five month period and john's predicting what would occur inside the city prior to the final day of destruction now again we go to historical records we look at josephus and his um the wars of the jews and he described the torment that occurred in that city before the romans actually scaled the walls so um I've not, you know, I've read some and I've left out some with with Josephus. It's, uh, you know, I do encourage people to read Josephus. It's a good, in, especially the Wars of the Jews. Okay, um, so what what's going on exactly is that there's this, this awful state of the in, uh, of all those in the city that are living leaving or living there. Okay, um, and, and it's usually unknown to most of us who read this, and we don't know what 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 side or uh, view that we're taking, but, um, but there's a lot of crazy stuff. I mean, they've locked, it's a fortified city. They've locked their selves in here. Um, like there's no way that they're, they're bringing down the walls, you know, that's what they thought, but they've burned up their food. They've got rid of food. They're killing each other. Okay. It's these, factions and these groups okay it's jew against jew okay so there's pillaging going on and this torment and it's rampant all right among among these various sects of the jews there so um 
some of them actually saw the Romans as possible saviors from their own people. Okay, so I'm going to give you some quotes from Josephus and, and just uh, just to get a, a better understanding of how bad it was in the city. Okay, so and it's it, it's important. Okay, so from Wars five one five, Josephus writes, <clears throat> and now as the city was engaged in a war on all sides. From these treacherous crowds of wicked men, the people of the city between them were like a great body torn in pieces. The aged men and the women were in such distress by their internal calamities that they wished for the Romans and earnestly hoped for an external external war in order uh, in order to their delivery from their domestic miseries. The noise also of those that were fighting was inst, um, inc- <laughs> incessant, both day and by night. But the lamentation of those that mourned exceeded the other, nor was there ever any occasion for them to leave off their lamentations because their calamities came perpetually one upon an- another. Although the deep um, consternation they were they were in prevented their outward welling, but being cons- constrained by their fear to conceal their inward passions, they were inwardly in- tormented, without daring to open their lips and groans. And when they had resolved upon anything, they executed it without mercy and omitted no method of torment or barbarity. And then he goes on to talk about more of the conditions during this time. Uh, five, again, five, ten, five. Um, <clears throat> well, not again. It was five, one, five. This is five, ten, five. It says, it is therefore impossible to go distinctly over every instance of these men's iniquity. I shall therefore speak my mind here at once briefly. Neither did any other city ever suffer such miseries, nor did any age ever breed a generation more fruitful in wickedness that this was from the beginning of the world. If you start that that may recall <laughs> some words from Jesus there. All right, Josephus continues in 6, 3, 4, and 5. It says, so, so those that were thus distressed by the famine were very um, desirous to die. And those already dead were esteemed happy because they had not lived long enough either to hear or to see such miseries. That, however, this action of eating one's own child ought to be covered with the overthrown of their very country itself. And men ought not to leave such a city upon the uh, habitable earth to be seen by the sun, wherein mothers are thus fed, although such food be fitter for the fathers than for the mothers to eat of, since it is they that continue still in a state of war against us after they have undergone such miseries as these. Okay, so we have a description that's going on and that those weren't as grisly as the other ones that you will read all right so um this is what's going on in chapter 9 of revelation and the jews are failing to repent and and they they don't they rejected jesus all right so uh this torment um is going on uh, what's been unleashed on them had been defeated and were being uh sent to the bottomless pit, this abyss, while Jesus was physically present on earth. But now the warning was that they would be led out of this abyss to carry out this torment. Now, John summarized it rightly, and he says um, in 9, 6, And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. Okay? Remember, they could not be killed, only tormented. So this was the end of the first woe. 
As I said, this may recall some words from Jesus, and this is a fulfillment of the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, 21, where he says, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as, as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. It seems that Josephus recognized this, even though he wasn't a Christian. Okay, so this ended the preview then of the torment that would follow the blowing of the fifth trumpet or the first woe. Nine twelve says the first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. Now, so the blowing of the first or the the first the fifth trumpet dealt with the internal condition of the city of Jerusalem before the Romans captured it. Okay, so the blowing of the sixth trumpet, or the second woe, is mentioned in Revelation 9.13, and it takes the action back outside the city where the Jews witness the approach of the armies um, of Rome. So after the blowing of this trumpet, four angels were released, um... And then we see the, 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 that these the movements of, uh, of the armies here are going then. Um, and it, it, it says to, I'm going to actually pull this one up here. I want to read this again uh, in nine. <clears throat> All right. Um, it says, <laughs> oh, man, it's cool. Um it's just cool language. I'm sorry. It's not, wasn't a cool thing that happened obviously, but all right. Um, the, the sixth angel blew his trumpet and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, uh, saying the six saying to the sixth angel angel who had the trumpet released the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels, uh, who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month and the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. Okay, well, if we can deal with angels being released to kill a third of mankind, I guess we can deal with God <laughs> releasing demons. Now, the the number of the mount, uh, mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number, and this is... I saw the horses in my vision, all right, and those who rode them. They wore breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and the sulfur, and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths all right all right so um by these three plagues a third a third there we go a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths okay so um these angels are directing these uh roman armies josephus says that the four legions of roman ar armies were stationed where exactly where revelation 9 mentions at the euphrates river all right, this was north. Um, this was the northeastern border of the promised land. So most of the enemies of Israel came from the north, and these armies were directed by Rome to move toward Israel to lead in this destruction. All right, so th now the number, um, <laughs> it th that number uh, I read it, it it's um, was twice ten thousand times ten thousand. All right. In the Greek language, it's just marauds of marauds. Okay. It's a metaphor. It's the same as us going like a gazillion. All right. So it's a, a number beyond uh, being able to count. And um, we hear a lot of stuff here uh, that's like I just read. The heads of the horses are like heads of lions, and out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone and all sulfur and, and things like that. And the power of the horses in their mouth and their tails. Um, the tails are like serpents and they have heads and with them, they do harm. So, um, you're in this fortified city, you're standing on the walls of Jerusalem and you're watching a great multitude of soldiers dressed in red with brilliant helmets. There's bright breastplates and their swords are reflecting in the sun as they march toward the city uh, you're seeing death and destruction coming towards you. All right. You know this. So <laughs> that that's the language that's being used here. All right. This is, this is the second, 
woe now, and the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. All right, so chapters 10 and 11 then are uh, described as an interlude between the blowing of the sixth and the seventh trumpets. And these two ch- chapters serve um, a, a purpose, okay? Um, the, the necessity of the interlude between the second and the third woes, woes become clear of the importance of the concept of, of witnesses and a theme that runs through the Bible, okay? It should be understood then, okay? So because there must be a witness before a final verdict can be carried out against the accused. And this principle is being applied here in Revelation, okay? So Jesus Jesus said about himself in John 5, 31, 32, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me, and I know I know that uh, the testimony which he gives about me is true. So Jesus isn't denying his own integrity here or, or, or anything like that. He's recognizing that without witnesses, judicially, a man's statement should not just be accepted as true all the time. And he goes on to include the scriptures as a witness to who he was, his divine sonship, okay, from and John uh, 5, uh, 39 through 40, he says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. So the point is that witnesses are cr- uh, critical in a judicial type of trial, okay? It would be against law to and improper it would be improper for god to condemn apostate israel without first calling witnesses to appear before the judgment seat of god so revelation is this story of this divorce of this indictment against apostate israel so god in keeping his own law within this covenant that is coming to an end um in regard to that necessity of witnesses he's going about it the way he should go about it so we find this in the old testament in deuteronomy 19 15 where it says a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed on the evidence of two or three witnesses a matter shall be confirmed okay now same thing is happening in Matthew 18 in, in, in uh, church discipline. All right. Um, the, <laughs> um, Jesus said, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed all right so not only are witnesses required when it comes to that discipline uh within the church but they're also required in the discipline of the elders of the church all right first timothy 5 19 do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses so um it's important then right um this thing it, it happens again in, um with with Paul, uh, he he's it was important that he make two trips to the the church in Corinth. Um, in Second Corinthians thirteen one, he says, "This is the third time I am coming to you. Every fact is to be confirmed by the mouth of two or three witnesses." Okay, so Paul commanded the Corinthian church to discipline some some members. Um, and, and, and all that okay so um i'm just going over that um there's some good things to take note of here okay so the point is that the law <clears throat> the law of god demanded two or three witnesses before a verdict okay now if you're saying well, we're not under the law that wasn't for us i understand that we're not jesus fulfilled the law this is dealing here with the ending of that old covenant now you know why is it being used by jesus and by by paul well because there's some just some good honest truth in 
some of God's law, some that are can be applicable. You know, we're not bringing up everything like, you know, lock up a woman while she's menstruating and all that type of stuff, because if she touches stuff during that time, it becomes unclean. You know, that stuff's not shown over and over in Scripture, especially in the New Testament. There's many, many things that aren't. These are just actual good uh, uh, things to be applied. Okay, so just in case somebody wants to make a comment about that. All right. So (laughs) the point being the law of God demanded two or three witnesses before a verdict of judgment could be carried out against the accused. Okay, so these witnesses need, need need not be a witness to the sin itself, but they may be witnesses to the failure of the accused to repent. So in regard to the witnesses here in Revelation, it should not surprise us that they appear here in chapter 11 because witnesses um, must appear at this point before God carried out his discipline against the city of Jerusalem. There had to be two or three witnesses. Okay. So then this brings us to this part in chapter 10, the interlude opens, um, directing our attention to this small scroll where it says, I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, uh, clothed with the cloud and the rainbow was upon his head and his face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book or a little scroll, which was open. Now it doesn't reveal what's in it. Um, that's just left to speculation. Um, <clears throat> we don't know. Okay. But, uh, we do know this. It says, When the seven pills of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven pills of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. <laughs> In other words, don't write what you just heard. All right. So then he's told, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took this little scroll out of the angel's hand and I ate it in my mouth. It was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. So it's, you know, (laughs) it's sweet, sweet in the mouth. It's going to mess your stomach up. Okay. Now, the Old Testament again helps us in understanding uh, chapter 10. Okay. Ezekiel chapter 2. Um, starting in verse 8 through chapter 3, verse 4, we have the same instructions that were given to Ezekiel where God was revealing the plans for the destruction of Jerusalem. In the scroll given to Ezekiel was a book of judgment, which was written written on the front and the back, and written on it were lamentations, mournings, and woes. Okay, so Ezekiel was told to eat it, right? Uh, God said, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he fed me the scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll, which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. And then in Ezekiel 3.14, it says, So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went embittered in the rage of my spirit. And the hand of the Lord was strong on me. Okay, so sweetness was followed by bitterness. And it was probably the bitterness of rejection felt by Ezekiel or, or, you know, uh, that, that, bit, bit. I stumble a lot. Sorry. (laughs) It should be entertaining. I don't know. Um, the, The point is simply that before God sent his judgment upon Jerusalem, both in the Old Testament, and now here in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, he called his prophets to, to, to do this thing, which, which happens to be eating the scroll, which is sweet, but then it becomes bitter in the stomach, all right? And it's, it predicted the future, all right? So the sweetness that they had, being called and set apart as a nation, nation all right? The blessed nation, right? The children of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham, all the sweet, sweet, sweetness became bitterness. All right. So there's 
other examples of this in the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> Ezekiel 4, 1 and 3, um, chapter 12 of Ezekiel as well. Um, you can go through those, but I'm not going to read them. Okay, so... <clears throat> Um, there, there's actually a, a, a part in Acts um, that's like this. Okay, Agabus was told to act out uh, what he saw to, as a warning to Paul of danger of going to Jerusalem. It says, as we were stay, staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said this is what the holy spirit says in this way the jews at jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the gentiles all right it, it's it's just there's an act a drama being played out of eat the scroll and, and it's going to do this okay so those are the things i'm pointing out to give you a better understanding of what's going on okay so <clears throat> now The second part of this interlude is chapter 11, all right? And its central characters are two witnesses. Now, who are the two witnesses? <laughs> for, first of all, for more information on two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord, you can go to Zechariah chapter 4. Now, like Elijah, these witnesses have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. All right. Their testimony was to be in the form of doing harm to their enemies. All right. It says they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. All right. This is reminiscent of Elijah and also of the plagues on Egypt. Okay. These powers are given to the two witnesses in chapter 11 to give testimony to the truth uh, from which they spoke. All right. And this is common in the Bible. All right. Uh, the miracles, the signs and wonders of Jesus attested to his authority as the son of God. Okay. So after their testimony was finished, they were going to be put to death temporarily by the beast that come, that came up out of the abyss and their dead bodies would lay in the streets of Jerusalem. The enemies rejoice over their deaths and then it says, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another um, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. All right. There would be this. It's just great. They would send gifts to one another. OK, <laughs> but then they were going to rise from the dead and be taken up into heaven like Elijah. OK, so um, there would be an earthquake then and seven seven thousand people killed and this seven thousand is identified as the tenth of the city all right the tenth of the city could be taken literally if the populate population of the city were about seventy thousand um that's not stretching it at all all right um but the process then of this increments again it it, it means the city was being destroyed over time okay and the breaking of the seven seals um the fraction one-fourth demonstrated partial judgment and blowing of the seven trumpets. The fraction one-third is demonstrated as partial judgment. And then here, fraction of one-tenth indicates a partial judgment of the city. And at this time of the two witnesses, 7,000 people in the city would die. And more is going to die later. And really, what's happening is Jerusalem is dying a slow death. Now, the two witnesses who who or what are they? Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. I'm going to give you some of the views here, a couple of the interpretations of what people say. Okay, some people think it's the law and the prophets, um, which would be the, all of the Old Testament. Some say it's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, so now... Um, let's go a little deeper, okay? Now, can... Can Gentry says, uh, whoa, sorry. Uh, <laughs> he says, some, uh, I, 
I've said Moses and Elijah before, okay? Um, uh, so, Ken, Ken Gentry says, somehow these witnesses relate to Moses and Elijah in that imagery from their ministries appear in the passage, okay? This is water to blood to, and drought. They're also related to Zechariah's prophecy of the gold lampstand and to olive trees in Zechariah 4, which I mentioned, um, which speaks of the rebuilding of the Old Testament temple under Joshua, who was a priest, and Zerubbabel, uh, a governor. Now, in both allusions, we have reference to the original founding of Israel as a nation and the reestablishment of it after the Babylonian exile. So, the two witnesses represent the founding of a new order for Israel upon the ruins of the old earthly Israel. This is the church of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus said he will take the kingdom from Israel and give it to a nation bearing the fruit thereof. All right, Matthew 21, 43. Um, Despite the persecution of Christianity, it, it shall rise from apparent defeat. Now, um, if the two witnesses are talking about Christians, um, why are they there? And they're going to be killed and then right. I, you know, I don't know. I'm just giving you that. Um, I, I, Moses and Elijah seems to fit because it does fit with that imagery. And they appeared at the Mount, uh, of transfiguration as well. It could also be the law and the prophets, which is all the Hebrew scriptures, but let me tell you about this other one. I'm just going to throw this one out here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is going to be a, a, a little longer of an episode. Okay. So um, we talk about the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God of the earth. Okay. Okay. Um, this is this description draws on Zachariah's vision of the lampstand and olive trees. Okay, now is as I am looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and on the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. Then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees? So he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord of the whole earth. So this is um, this vision came on the hills of Zechariah's vision of the high priest concerning the high priest Joshua, who served alongside the governor Zerubbabel, I've mentioned that, and, and Gentry's thing, okay? Now, this representation that the the ministers of religion stand before the Lord, is it's not uncommon in, in the Bible. So it's, it's said of the priest and the Levites, all right? The Lord separated the tribe of Levi to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless his name. And this is in Deuteronomy, okay? The same thing is said of the prophets, and as in the cases of Elijah and Elisha. Um, so the representation is that they ministered and uh, constantly in his presence under his eye. Why? Because they were set apart for this. Now, in Zechariah's vision, he saw one lampstand. In Revelation 1, John saw seven lampstands, which he was told were the seven churches. And here in Revelation 11, there were two lampstands, the two witnesses now here's way it may may get a little wonky for some of you but there were um there were two first century high priests by the name um ananus ben ananus <laughs> and uh jesus ben uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce these names gamaliel all right, also known as Joshua. Now, according to, to Josephus, they led a peace movement in Jerusalem when the zealots were determined to, to re rebel and entice war with the Romans, hoping to gain full independence for Israel. All right, but their roles and their death and the aftermath of their deaths, deaths and the timing of their death line up with a number of details that John sees in Revelation 11. Now, 
you know, if you want to look, you you know, I I don't know how far I should go, but you know, they they were appointed as these high priests. Um, Josephus calls one the 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 ancient ancientest ancientest. <laughs> of the high priest a very prudent man um he preferred peace above all things a shrewd man in speaking and persuading the people and uh he was also appointed general over jerusalem and one of 10 generals appointed to prepare for war with rome in 66 a.d um jesus or maybe it was jesus but i think it's jesus uh, or joshua was uh, he, the, he was appointed high priest it's recorded as well. He was appointed in 63, but between 63 and 64 AD, only for about a year. From that time on, Josephus said Jerusalem was in great disorder and all things grew worse and worse. But he re- referred to him as a friend and a companion, and he called him the eldest of the high priests next to uh, Ananus. So Josephus added that although he was inferior to Ananus upon the comparison he was superior to the rest and he also gave a long speech against the zealots and and that's recorded and uh and and Ananus or whatever his name is he he gave a speech against them as well now there was this zealot temple siege that took place in uh between February and March of 68 AD and this the siege took place after the zealots appointed a fake high priest all right. Um, he didn't even really understand what a high priest was. And um, so, in a sense, the two that I have mentioned represented the final lampstands, the final oil bearing olive trees of the temple before it was destroyed. All right. Now, um, y- you know, just take that. Take that as you will. You know, I, 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 I don't know. Um, it's very, very interesting, but I've given you the viewpoints there and the different interpretations. There are more. I would try to, I, you know, I like to stick with Moses and Elijah or the law and the prophets. Okay. So <laughs> there you go with that. There's more. There's somebody. There's another thing too, that there was a man that they, they, there's someone who said, because there's historical records too of a man who some people think was maybe Jesus again came and was telling the city to repent and was one of these witnesses. I, you know, some of it's wonky. I, I understand that. So let, let's just finish this up. Okay. So the last five verses of chapter 11, <laughs> um, present the blowing of the seventh trumpet. And John takes, takes us back the reader back into heaven again. And the pouring out of the wrath of God in the seven bowls had not started yet, but the celebration in heaven has begun. And it says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Then in Revelation eleven eighteen it says, And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to, to destroy those who destroy the land. Okay, this was the third woe. Um, it's, also, uh, it, it's also reminiscent of Psalm 2. All right, so finally, then in the last verse, it says, The temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. So, again, um, as the... As the temple on earth was being destroyed, we're given a glimpse into the temple of God in heaven. The first temple was temporary. The second heavenly temple is eternal. So the reason here is given for the blowing of the seven trumpets in a a very loose overview, all right, Um. They were to give warning to the final execution of judgment that was coming. The blowing of 
each of the last three trumpets was also called a woe. In the interlude, the city of Jerusalem was identified as the place where also their Lord was um, uh, uh, crucified. Um, but this was was at the end of Israel because only a portion of the land, one third, would be judged. And John gave a view of what was happening both inside the city and outside the city. And then the final blow was to come. And so before the final judgment, this biblical law must be fulfilled. And so we have these witnesses before the accused who are Jerusalem and before they could be condemned. OK, so in these two chapters, we had we went through that and those those witnesses and all this drama, okay? So the pouring out of the seven bowls and the last set of the three sevens are going to begin in chapter 16, okay? But in chapters 12 through 14, John's going to identify in more detail the three enemies of the persecuted church. And in chapter 15, John will return to the scene in heaven to observe more worship of God. And that's that's your overview for this section, okay? Um, now we'll start to get into the three enemies of the early church. All right. Um, Satan, the Roman empire, the beast, um, and all that good stuff. So, um, hope that helps you. I hope that gives you a better understanding of the first century context when it comes to those and when the seven trumpets and the woes and all that good stuff, <laughs> well, it wasn't good, but I think you know what I mean. So until next time, my friends. Keep reading. All right, there's another episode. If you have any questions, comments, disagreements, feel free to comment in any form of social media or send me an email at the Kingdom Project Podcast at gmail.com. And until next time, be a mustard seed, be loving, and thank you for listening.